Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for Ischio Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Bob Akish Rafi. Today is May 13th, 2020, and I'm speaking with three faculty at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing about nursing during epidemics. Julie Fairman, Patricia D'Antonio, and Cindy Connolly. Julie Fairman is the Nightingale Professor in honor of nursing veterans and chair of the Biobehavioral Health Sciences Department. Julie has written several books on the history of nursing practice, including Making Room in the Clinic and Critical Care History, and now focuses on social justice and healthcare as a civil right. Welcome to our podcast, Julie. Well, thank you, Babek. I'm, I'm really happy to be able to participate. Are there lessons or object lessons from your historical work that we should be paying attention to now during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, there are actually quite a few, but the one that I think I'd like to focus on is the way nurses work beyond what's thought of as their traditional boundaries during times of wars and epidemics. So nurses really have provided services during almost all epidemics. They've always been there and they've been very visible from time to time. They're drawings of nuns who nursed in Philadelphia in the yellow fever epidemic of the 1700s and the black nurses who tended to TB patients and then the nurses in the polio units and then later the AIDS units and now during this crisis. So what's interesting is that we have seen these nurses, they're so visible right now on Twitter as they face down anti-social distancing protesters. They're seen on Facebook, on TV, and online feeds and newspapers as they tell their stories. We know nurses are now valued and they're really valorized because people see and acknowledge what they're doing firsthand and how they provide care in an instance when medical science really has no cure. And many have died. And they are doing so much more than serving as staff to health professionals, as Paul Starr would have described, and he was talking about physicians who are putting themselves at risk. So the question is, what happens when this pandemic passes? Will the public's perception of nurses' worth and value fade, even when their everyday work is expert? Everything nurses do every day is built and based on expertise. Will nurses be able to capitalize on their public support? Although I've been hearing recently about nurses being socially shunned when they're on the subway by people who are fearful of contagion. You know, will they be able to maintain the authority in clinical decision making that they've taken on now because of shortages and because of just overwhelming numbers so that they can provide better access to high quality services for the public? Interestingly enough, after the flu pandemic and World War I was winding down, nursing leaders were raising some of the similar but really contextually different issues. So there's a great quote from some nursing leaders in 1918, and they said, quote, when the war is over, nurses must begin to take management of their affairs into their own hands. Members of a profession do not look to other groups of people to fix their educational standards or regulate the conditions under which they shall do their work. The value of a trained nurse as part of our national economic structure, which is interesting, has been demonstrated so conclusively during this period that the right of nursing to a recognized place, among other health professionals, has certainly been proven. So they were already thinking about this in 1918. And we see also from the historical record during the pandemic and World War I that these nurses, no matter where they were, took on responsibilities and work typically in the medical realm. For example, organizing the workforce or diagnosing and treating and in newspaper stories. And, and interestingly, there's an incredible array of piano sheet music that actually speaks to what they were doing. And we also know that gains in authority and responsibility and public support did not exactly continue after the war or the pandemic. So the public conflicts, they resumed between physicians who believed that nurses were too educated and overstepped their authority. And nursing leaders were trying to maintain education standards to support the expanded work roles. But they were also, ironically, which has also connections to today, trying to secure the title of nurse because they wanted to eliminate competition from less trained attendants and other workers. It's an interesting correlation to physicians and nurse practitioners. So today, as the coronavirus really overwhelms our health provider workforce, there are governors in many states, as well as the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, 
they're lifting restrictive regulatory barriers. For example, the need to supervise physician supervision for prescription and treatment. I mean, nurses are educated, nurse practitioners are educated to do this, but they still require this physician supervision in some states. And and they need to be able to legally practice, I think, to their full authority. So the question is also, will public support for nurses convince state leaders to keep these restrictions lifted? And colleagues and I, Cindy Connolly and Patricia D'Antonio, recently wrote an editorial for The Hill. Nurse practitioners should be in about this idea of keeping these restrictions lifted. You know, every time you write a blog, you get responses to that blog. And if what we have heard in the comment section of The Hill is any indication, the conflicts between nurse practitioners and physicians and pharmacists and social workers over professional jurisdiction will continue with vigor and it will be polar and it will be an emotional debate and nobody's mentioning how heroic the nurses are. So, you know, at this time, I think the public really needs access to healthcare providers, including nurse practitioners. We need them for our overflowing hospitals, but we also need those for people who still have routine healthcare needs, like urinary tract infections, asthma, seasonal allergies, heart conditions, and and more. And these health promotion activities, such as well, child care should not be curtailed. And none of these things go away during pandemics. But in more than half of the states in our country, more than half of them have restrictive state regulations to prevent these nurse practitioners from providing the services to patients in particularly rural and poor urban areas or large acute institutions, small community hospitals, and everywhere in between. The American Academy of Nurse Practitioners has really put out a lot of policy statements during this time, urging governors with restrictive regulations to lift these roadblocks that hamper patients' access to patient care. And they have been somewhat successful, although many of these states still require nurse practitioners to have what's called a legal supervisory contract with physicians in order to practice. And these contracts, I believe, put people in these states at risk. Because without a contract, the nurse practitioner can't practice. They can't prescribe a certain category of drugs. They can't admit people to hospitals. They can't fill prescriptions. They can't refer patients to nursing homes or even do simple things like ordering equipment for rehabilitation services. So many states and polar states like Tennessee and Massachusetts have lifted these restrictions. And the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has also pushed the pause button by issuing temporary waivers that actually allow nurse practitioners to practice to their full scope without requiring physician supervision. So two policy changes, I think. You know, we always think about history and what it tells us, what it means for us, and how it provides meaning to our current situation. And out of that, you know, should come some sort of policy recommendations if that's what you're aiming for. And there are two, I think, that we should think about. And one of them is that we should immediately waive all restrictive physician supervisory regulations. And these waivers, I think by both states and CMS, might as well go for broke here, right? Should be made permanent. And states and the CMS should press their pause buttons. And these pause buttons need to become standard practice. For example, if our nurse practitioners are good enough to provide care during the pandemic, they will be just as good when this pandemic is over. But will the medical profession's typical stand on occupational barriers still exist? as they did post-influenza, post-polio, and post-AIDS? Or will our new normal allow for continued expanded practice boundaries? So I think in closing that the idea of writing this post-pandemic script will really require the learning and unlearning of these historic lessons. Julie, thank you for sharing your perspectives with us. Well, thank you again for letting me join you. Patricia D'Antonio is the Carol Ware Professor of Mental Health and the director of the Barbara Bates Center for the Study of the History of Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania. She is the author of Nursing with a Message, Public Health in New York City, 1920 to 1940, and American Nursing, A History of Knowledge, Authority, and the Meaning of Work. Thank you for joining us, Pat. Thank you for having me. Based on your historical work, are there issues that you think we should be paying greater attention to now? One of the issues that has always fascinated me when we're talking about pandemics, epidemics, war, times of great national emergencies, 
is that we have never, ever had enough nurses to meet the needs, both the immediate needs of those who are sick or wounded in the military and the needs of those who are sick at home or with other kinds of issues that might necessitate hospitalizations. We see this in the 1918 flu pandemic, where the call, whether it be from city or state health departments, the American Red Cross, was, please, we need more nurses. The doctors are wonderful, but what is saving lives, since we don't have a treatment, we don't have a vaccine, is the kind of care that nurses provide, the hydration, the nutrition, the ventilation, the emotional support that nurses gave. There was a clear recognition that what was needed at that point in time was nursing care. And there was a clear recognition that even though nurses, and I'm talking about trained registered nurses, responded, there still wasn't enough. And we had to turn toward religious groups. I mean, it was a chance for religious orders to demonstrate that Catholicism was not some sort of counterinsurgency. We saw Red Cross creating short courses for women who wanted to contribute. We saw all of these kinds of experiments in getting more nurses into the workforce. We see it again in something that's been even more well studied, which is the shortage of nurses in wartime, particularly first in the First World War, but what's been most well studied is nursing in the Second World War. Every time we enter a war, we know there's going to be a shortage of nurses. And the government, in collaboration with nursing organization, tries to plan ahead. For World War I, they created a really innovative program where they took college graduates, educated them for a week at Vassar College, and then sent them to training schools across the country where they would relieve other students who were about ready to graduate so these students could go into the military. Again, World War II, another anticipated shortage. And so what happened was for the first time in history, the federal government became directly involved in nursing education. It passed a landmark bill, properly known as the Cadet Nurse Corps Bill, which promised free tuition, room and board, uniforms, expenses to any woman It did not include men because nursing at this time was very segregated by gender, but it did provide some provisions for Black women who were in Black training schools because we were also segregated by race. But any woman who wanted to train as nurse would receive three years of a free education in exchange for serving, quote, for the duration of the war. This federal money pouring into nursing schools really had a profound effect on the independence of training schools because they had their own money and their own budget. But even with this startling example, by 1943-44, there still was not enough nurses to take care of the sick and wounded in the military. And what I'm particularly fascinated about is the kinds of changes these shortages bring about. People, the society, the public couldn't countenance the fact that their wounded sons, brothers, husbands did not have nurses taking care of them. And there was actually a bill on President Franklin Roosevelt's desk. And the bill was for the first time ever, the federal government would be authorized to draft women as nurses into the armed forces. Fortunately, there was a coalition ready and waiting for just this moment where they would choose to use it to expose systematic discrimination that did exist in nursing at the time. One of the people involved in this coalition was Eleanor Roosevelt, Franklin's wife, who alerted her friends and colleagues in the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses, who mobilized their friends and relatives in the Black clergy, the Black press. And the next day, the headlines screamed across the country, why are we willing to draft 
white nurses when we have over 9,000 black nurses ready, trained, and willing to serve tomorrow. It's hard to overestimate the drama of this situation, but the next day, the Army Nurse Corps desegregated. For the first time, Black women traveled overseas as nurses for sick and wounded soldiers, and it had profound implications for nursing and its ability to move toward a more inclusive place where it would consider Black women as nurses. What I find fascinating about the COVID crisis right now is we have not yet seen the calls for more nurses. And I wonder as a historian where those calls are, because what we see is we see what the media determines is dramatic, is important. We are seeing these really incredible stories of nurses who are battling the coronavirus crisis, initially without enough protective equipment, battling it through long hours, battling their own fears of possibly infecting their patients. And I wonder if the stories that will also come out of this crisis is what's happening to the sick at home, because we don't have stories about all the patients who were discharged to make way for all the beds that were anticipated would be needed to take care of coronavirus patients. We know that people are having strokes and heart attacks. We know they're not going to hospitals. Are they at home and who's taking care of them at home? What about those who still need care because of chronic illnesses? What about those who are suffering from mental illness, who are now at home? Who is taking care of them? And do we have the resources to take care of them? And will we see a call for these kinds of nurses when the drama of the coronavirus care that's going on in hospitals dies down and we have a chance to step back and take stock of all the other sick people who still need care even in times of crisis. So I'm both really interested historically in what are we doing to make sure we have enough nurses and why we are kind of only focusing on one group of nurses who deserve all the attention they're getting. But there are so many other needs at home in the community that as yet we haven't heard how they're being met. And finally, what are going to be the long-term consequences of this? Thank you, Pat, for raising these important issues for us. You're welcome. Cindy Connolly is the Rosemary B. Greco Endowed Term Chair in Advocacy at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. She is a pediatric nurse and author of two award-winning monographs on the history of children's health in the U.S. Thank you for joining us, Cindy. Well, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here and excited to talk about this topic. Cindy, how do considerations of COVID-19 differ when viewed through the lens of the profession of nursing instead of medicine? There are lots of different things with regard to nursing and COVID-19, but I'd like to focus in on one specifically that has received a lot of attention in the media for both graduating nursing students and graduating medical students. For example, this spring, we saw universities able to pretty quickly across the country move medical students, graduate them early, move them into practice because of all the needs stemming from this pandemic. But that was much harder to do for nursing students. And the reasons for that stem from the differences in the ways in which nursing and medical education evolved. And so as a historian, I thought it really raised a lot of very interesting questions about the ways in which history informs what we think are our options in contemporary policy and practice. So, for example, as I mentioned, we saw that in a number of states, fourth-year medical students were able to graduate, move quickly into position. It just didn't happen for nurses as seamlessly. And so why is that? I'm not a historian of 
medical education, but I can tell you a few things about that. So medical school, of course, is just the beginning of medical education. Once graduated, new doctors enter residency programs where they're pretty closely supervised. And those training hospitals receive billions of dollars from the federal government to continue training physicians, mostly, not exclusively from Medicare, but mostly through Medicare. It was built into Medicare when Medicare was created back in the 1960s. Nursing's trajectory is different. First of all, hospitals have largely balked at any kind of nurse residency programs since they want a ready-made nurse workforce as much as possible. While all new nurses receive some kind of orientation to their job, generally it lasts weeks, occasionally months, at a place that's considered top-notch, it might be months, but most of the time it's weeks. And there's an economic disincentive for hospitals to have any kind of extended orientation or residency programs for new nurses right out of nursing school, since federal government support for nursing education, which is significantly less than for medical education, it occurs while they're in their training program, meaning the funding goes to the individuals themselves to help pay tuition in the forms of grants or low-interest loans, and very occasionally through a special targeted program to nursing schools, but nothing goes to hospitals to support nursing education the way it does medical education. So in addition to the funding differences in how medical and nursing education evolved, there are a number of other differences that seem to make it more difficult to graduate nurses a little early to get them into practice the way physicians were able to be graduated a little early. While medical education transformed from an apprenticeship model in the late 19th and early 20th centuries into university-based postgraduate programs, the apprenticeship model for nursing education continued to dominate for a large part of the 20th century. Nursing students served as staff for the hospitals in which they were apprenticing, and this was a necessary economic model because hospitals were largely charity-driven until Medicare and Medicaid. There were a few collegiate-based nursing programs that started in the early 20th century, and then after World War II, two two-year associate community college programs also evolved, wherein you could train to be a registered nurse. But what this meant was that for the latter half of the 20th century, there were three ways for nurses to get into practice. And so Nursing Practice Acts were written to be very specific and look very carefully at different programs, assessing quantity and quality at a very microscopic level, counting hours and other specific metrics. All three of those types of programs still exist, although the bachelor's degree model is now the most dominant one. But because of those three ways to get into practice, It was and always has been very confusing in American society about what is a nurse and who is able to call themselves a nurse. And that's distinctly different than it was for medicine by the early part of the 20th century. So all these various ways for nurses to get into practice has led state boards of nursing and states to look very differently and, again, in a very microscopic way into what graduate nursing students need to have in order to get into practice. And so states reacted in a variety of different ways to COVID-19 with regard to nursing students in their senior year. So Ohio, for example, made it possible for nurses close to graduation to get a temporary nurse licensure as long as they were students in good standing and move quickly into practice, just as they did for their medical students. California, on the other hand, it was very different. There was a major battle in California that lasted till actually early April because the State Board of Nursing in California refused to allow any substitution for the very rigid number of clinical hours they required for nursing students to even have it substituted with high fidelity simulation. Likely, this was going to prevent tens of thousands of nurses from graduating and moving quickly into practice. My colleagues at the Bates Center, Pat D'Antonio, Julie Fairman, and I 
really wanted to think about this and look at some of these state practice acts. And we were lucky enough to get some funding from Penn's Leonard Davis Institute to look at the challenges of getting nurses into practice quickly. And one of the things that most listeners will know is that the COVID-19 pandemic has drawn many comparisons to the 1918 flu epidemic. And a lot of them are well-reasoned and grounded in evidence, but others aren't. But a crisis such as COVID-19 highlights the importance of having an adequate supply of well-educated clinicians, but also the flexibility to deploy them, including those that are very close to completing their training. And so we are arguing in our study that is going to compare nursing's response in 2020 to the 1918 flu epidemic, specifically focusing on the state of Pennsylvania, that a nimble and flexible regulatory response regarding the nursing workforce is as essential to a fully integrated public health approach to crises and pandemics as is having enough personal protective equipment and ventilators and other technology. We tend not to think about nursing or medical state practice acts as key to frontline responses to pandemics, but we're going to do a comparison of how in 1918, when nurses just fluidly left nursing school and went into practice, an era where nursing was very lightly regulated, to a time in 2020 when nursing is very tightly regulated. What were the strengths, the weaknesses of each approach? To what extent does licensure protect the public? To what extent does it protect the profession that is seeking that regulation? And so we're using a number of different electronic resources to do this. Many of our own collections are digitized at the Bates Center, many other Pennsylvania State archives and materials through the National Library of Medicine. The University of Michigan's Digital Influenza Archive has also proven very helpful. We are piecing together the ways in which Pennsylvania and Philadelphia responded in terms of nursing regulation after the 1918 flu epidemic and going to compare it to 2020. Thank you, Cindy, for sharing your work and your perspectives with us. Well, thank you so much. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. You can find more resources for exploring this topic, other podcasts, video lectures, archival spotlights, as well as opportunities to connect with our community of scholars at chstm.org. This podcast is made possible with the generous support of the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Rita Allen Foundation.